Well, now that Lincoln Riley is at USC, the on-field implications are pretty evident for other Pac-12 schools. But what about the recruiting implications? What are the ramifications of USC being back on the recruiting trail? We'll discuss today with Carter Baines, a senior writer and editor at BeaverBlitz.com. Let's go. Our Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster. Thanks for making this your first listen or or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Conference of Champions. Like, comment, subscribe wherever you are listening to or watching the show. I appreciate the hundreds of you out there who have already done so. Our YouTube numbers continue to look great. They keep going up. I appreciate all of you making that happen. And uh, fittingly, I happen to be wearing an Avengers t-shirt today, and that's uh, appropriate because we're doing a little team up here on Locked on Pac-12. I'm not alone. For those of you watching on YouTube, Carter Baines is his name, senior writer and editor at beaverblitz.com. I'm sure he's still uh, mourning the unfortunate end of the Oregon State baseball season, which uh, came to a close in the Super Regional against Auburn. But they just eliminated Stanford, so there's clearly a worse team that you could have lost to there, Carter. Yeah, mourning the fact that I didn't get to go to Omaha, but also kind of relishing in the fact that I get a week off here before I have to really <laughs> kind of start to dive into football season. Um, you know, I put together a content schedule yesterday and was like, all right, here we go. This is this we're you know, we're gearing up for the long haul here. But um, yeah, no, this this week has been nice. Just a little relaxation. Um, you know, don't really need to think about baseball, football, nothing yet. Um, just kind of, kind of living in the moment for a few days, which is something that I haven't gotten a chance to do for quite a while. Well, we appreciate taking the time to come on the show and, uh, let's get your toe wet a little bit on the, uh, the subject of college football and, and talk about recruiting. Cause I think when Lincoln Riley was announced as USC's next head football coach. Everyone's thinking, you know, obviously, because it's the most important part of the college football sphere of, you know, how is this going to have an impact on the program? Can they win a conference championship right away? And now, you know, Oregon's not going to be able to, it's not going to feel like Oregon, Utah, and everybody else. You're going to have USC in the mix. I mean, there's all these sorts of things, but I think the recruiting ramifications here are, are pretty significant. So when you look at it in, in that context of, how other schools in the Pac-12 now have to recruit against, at least in theory, a very resurgent USC. And I only say in theory because we haven't seen it yet, but I think we all know what's going to happen there. Uh, How do you think about, you know, how other schools now have to recruit with USC certainly, uh, you know, capable of bringing in high caliber recruits and they've already done so and will continue to do so in the class of 2023? Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it before, you know, it's going to take a couple of years for USC to fully be back, you know, quote unquote, back, um, you know, to to the potential powerhouse that it could very well be. But I think as far as recruiting goes, you've already seen that kind of start to tick up. Um, and I think it will continue to do so. So th- the one thing that's, that kind of jumps out to me right away, and my first thought when Lincoln Riley was introduced as head coach was, wow, this really hurts two schools in particular. I think it really hurts Oregon, who's recent success recruiting wise has been predicated on USC not being able to keep guys in LA. And then it hurts UCLA, obviously, because, you know, you've got a a potential national powerhouse in your backyard that's going to, you know, pry away some guys um, that you might be looking at in your backyard. Um, So I, I think those two schools face the biggest challenge with Lincoln Riley coming in and, you know, potentially poaching some of the guys that they might have been relying on you know, coming to their schools recently. Um, a name like Kayvon Thibodeau comes to mind. You know, if Lincoln Riley is the head coach at Justin USC Wallace four too. years ago, is Kayvon Thibodeau a duck? I mean, probably not. Um, so that's that's the kind of recruiting battle that I think is going to start to lean USC's direction again, uh, which obviously hurts Oregon, who has, like I said, you know, really been the, the primary benefactor of, uh, of, of, you know, USC's demise on the recruiting trail. Um, I, I, I think Oregon 
you know, is, is going to have to start to look elsewhere. And obviously, I, I think Oregon has established itself as a recruiting uh, powerhouse and will be able to to pry guys away. But it's just that you're, you know, you're competing against Lincoln Riley, whereas before you were competing against Clay Helton, who was not necessarily uh, locking things down in L.A. Yeah, and, and I think that one, one element of that particular offseason recruiting battle that'll be fascinating to follow in the coming years is will there be a divide between offensive and defensive players going one direction because obviously you know coaching staffs are going to recruit both sides of the ball but does Dan Lanning who we're going to talk about more later in the episode being at Oregon help them you know more towards uh, a big time defensive player like maybe a Mateo Uyunglele or uh, uh, Jaden Wayne. I mean, you just, you, you don't know, but that's, you know, something that I, I think is going to be fascinating to follow. Whereas Lincoln Riley is, you know, already got Malachi Nelson in the class of 2023. And I saw him a couple weeks ago at the OT seven camp in Las Vegas. And he is a ridiculous looking prospect. Oregon. Meanwhile, at this point in time is still looking for a quarterback commit in the class of 2023. And they just got knocked out of the, the Jaden Rashada sweepstakes. So, what would you uh, hypothetically, or what I should say, what would you theorize will be the the breakdown there? Do you think it'll be more random, or do you think that you know that'll be in in the back of recruits' mind? Is that Dan Lanning is going to you know in theory make his money on defense, whereas Lincoln Riley we know is going to be all in on offense? Yeah, that, I mean that could very well kind of rear its head a little bit. Um, I think you know you, you look at the guys who USC has brought in transfer portal and and the early the early recruiting returns uh, from the the prep ranks from Lincoln Riley. And a lot of those flashy names are on the offensive side of the ball. Um, whereas Oregon, you know, obviously I, I keep more up to date with Oregon state recruiting than Oregon, but you know, I, I keep tabs on it and, you know, you see when those four and five star guys commit and um, I, it, I, I don't think Oregon has necessarily brought in the level, the caliber of guys that USC has since Lincoln Riley took over. Um, I'm just curious if, you know, to your point, they're able to pry away a defensive guy here and there because you've got one of the best defensive coordinators in the, in the country as your head coach now. So um, obviously, you know, there's a, there's a track record of success, a track record of getting guys to the NFL. I mean, look at George's defense, like, you know, that's the entire first round of the NFL draft right there. So, um, yeah, there's I, I think there's a draw there for sure for defensive guys. It's just, you know, does the draw of playing at USC outweigh the benefits of playing for a Dan Lanning type? One interesting note at, at this point in, in the recruiting cycle for 2023 is Lanning and his staff look to have their their first full classes that most of the you know recruiting victories or notable commitments that they've gotten so far have actually come on the offensive side of the ball. I think duck fans are still kind of waiting for that, that next line of, you know, really high end defensive commitments. It doesn't mean that they, they aren't going to to happen, but I think, you know, there, there have been a couple players, you know, Cody DeCambra, a decent looking safety, Cole Martin, a pretty high rated corner, but, you know, getting a, a David Hicks, a Jaden Wayne, a Mateo Uyunglele, one of those, you know, big five-star defensive linemen, I think would sort of shift the tenor around that recruiting class. Cause right now you look at Oregon's biggest recruiting victories and it's, you know, Josh Connerly coming to the ducks and not USC. Same with Jalil Florence, one of those is an offensive player, one, a defensive player, Kyler Casper, a receiver. They've added some running backs via the transfer portal and Dante Dowdell commitment as well. So it's been very offensively based. And I wonder if that will continue to, to be the way that the recruiting commitments come in for Oregon in the coming years. And if it continues to be that offensive heavy, I want to ask you about the team that, you know, the best Carter, and that is of course, Oregon state. But first I want to tell you that, you know, how our friends at build are always coming out with amazing new flavors. Well, They've really outdone themselves with their new mud pie flavor. And for the first time ever, they're introducing the new mud pie, mud pie flavor in both a mud pie bar and a mud pie puff. I've had both of them. They are out of this world, even better than mint brownie, which all of or some of you may know is uh, my favorite flavor of all of them. 150 calories, eight grams of sugar packed with 16 grams of protein. And it's wrapped up with a bunch of delicious flavors just for you. Go to built.com. Use promo code lock 15. Get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. 
So let's shift gears a little bit to the program in Oregon that does uh, not historically recruit against the sort of players that USC is uh, going to go after, and that's Oregon State. What, what's kind of the latest on the recruiting trail w- with the Beavs, Carter, both in 2022 and kind of you know the, the early stages, which is where we are with the class of 2023? Well, I think one of the big things you just mentioned there is, yeah, Oregon State does not typically get into recruiting battles with USC. So I think that's one of the schools that might not necessarily feel the, you know, the pain of Lincoln Riley coming in and stealing some of your, you know, your potential talent. Oregon State's more recruiting against the Utahs, the ASUs, uh, the Washingtons, you know, those those types of programs. Um, And so far in 2022 and 23, uh, as we get into the fourth, fifth, and even sixth recruiting classes under Jonathan Smith, which is a little hard to imagine. It, it's a little hard to believe at this point. Like Jonathan Smith has been here for half a decade. Time flies. Um, yeah, time time seriously flies. But no, the the recruiting is certainly up. It has has made an uptick in the last year or two, and I, I think you're starting to see that on the 2023 side. Um, I'll touch on some 22 commits and enrollees here in just a second, but. I think the big name uh, that Oregon State fans are over the moon about right now is quarterback Aiden Childs, who just committed about two weeks ago on his official visit to Oregon State. Uh, This is a quarterback who had a ton of Power 5 offers, some Pac-12 offers. Um, He had just taken a visit to Washington State. Um, I I believe he had a a visit at Washington as well. High three-star, according to 24-7 Sports, but I can... I can definitely see this guy being a, a mid four star by the time he ends up in Corvallis. Um, he hasn't played a full season since he was a true freshman or a, a freshman in high school. Um, you know, he's he's done nothing but but stand out. It's just that he hasn't really had the opportunities to do so. I think the sky's the limit for him. He's a dual threat guy. And um, everything that I've heard from our recruiting experts, everything I've seen from, you know, his film and everything tells me that Oregon State might have found its quarterback of the future uh, coming in next year as part of the 2023 class. So um, that's a name to keep an eye on way down the line. But um, it, in the near future, some of the 2022 guys that just arrived on campus this week, move in day was a couple of days ago. Uh, Damian Martinez, I, I think you and I have talked about him before yep. on the pod. Yep, running uh, this, back. Yeah, the, the standout of of spring camp for Oregon State by far. Comes in as a true freshman, early enrollee, uh, and I think had one of the best springs of anybody and is somebody who I could see in the starting lineup as early as week one, if you know, if not um, somewhere later on in, the, you know, in non-conference or maybe the conference opener. I think he's eventually going to get the job. Um, that's just how good he is this early in his career. Um, reminds me a lot of Jamar Jefferson. I, I think his ability to come in right away and contribute. And, you know, it's interesting that the the quarterback, what was the quarterback recruit's name? You just, I'm just blanking right now. Aiden Childs. Aiden Childs. So he's dual threat guy. That's not yeah. typically what you associate with Oregon State. I mean, right. when was the last time the Beavers had a true dual threat mobile quarterback. I mean, you think all well, the ones over the outside years. of chance Nolan, I guess, but yeah, yeah, I, he, he's more of a guy who I would say is, is mobile rather than, mm-hmm. you know, being a runner. And part of that might be the offensive system. Uh, he's probably one of the more athletic ones, but you go back to, you know, the, the Sean Mannions or, or Canfields, or it's just been kind of a consistent trend. So I wonder if Smith wants to do anything differently offensively by the time he, he, he has him in, in Corvallis as his quarterback and thinks, you know, well, maybe this opens up this opportunity that he didn't have before. But he also make a good point that Chance Nolan is a, is a decent athlete. But uh, let, let's uh, switch gears and talk about some recent coaching hires because I've been evaluating these guys and, you know, the, the way that they were brought in or, you know, kind of how it, how it felt when they came in, looking at, you know, a variety of different areas and, and kind of grading the hires that, themselves. I want your take on on Oregon's hire of Dan Lanning when he was announced as Oregon's next head coach. What was your reaction and, and kind of how do you assess, you know, where he could potentially steer the program? I felt like it was really risky, to be honest. I, I think, you know, the the lack of head coaching experience, obviously, he's a first time head coach now. Yep. And the fact that he'd only been a coordinator for, what, three years Um 
I, I just felt like the body of work wasn't necessarily there to make me feel ultra confident that this guy could come in right away and take Oregon to the next level. Um, you know, the recruiting prowess that you saw under Mario Cristobal, that's going to be tough to replicate. But I think what he brings to the mix is like just better X's and O's coaching all around. And, and I think that's what Oregon needs. Um, obviously the talent is there. The talent has been there. I, I don't think there's a team West of Texas that has as much talent as Oregon right now. Um, the problem is I, I don't think Oregon's had the coaching staff to make great use of it for a long time. Um, I, I think that has been Oregon's downfall recently is an inability to develop the guys that they bring in and, I mean, look no further than Justin Herbert, a guy who I, I think underperformed his potential at, at Oregon just because the still had was- still had a great career. But True. now that we see what he has become in the NFL, it's yeah. unquestionable that you look back and go, all right, something was left on the table here. Here's a great stat for you, Carter, on, on that note. And I'll let you get back to your, your point as a senior, not as a junior, not a freshman, as a senior, Justin Herbert threw a screen pass on almost 24 percent of his pass attempts. He was throwing the ball at or behind the line of scrimmage, almost one out of every four attempts. And he's got maybe the easiest, biggest arm in the NFL. That's not, uh, that's not Josh Allen. I think Allen's got a bigger one, but I think Herbert flicks the ball downfield with power easier than even Mahomes. And to that end, there was a, there was a point late in the season, if not at season's end where Jake Luton at Oregon state had a better QB rating than Justin Herbert. And Mm -hmm. I I mean, I don't think any of us are going to sit here and say Jake Luton's the better quarterback. So clearly, clearly you are not utilizing your assets uh, to perfection if that is the case. But um, no, to to that point, I I think, you know, you bring in a staff who has a track record of success, obviously Lanning, you know, just produced arguably the greatest college football defense of all time. Uh, You bring that in and, you know, that's a guy who made the most of his talent for sure. Um, and, and I think that's what, what Oregon needs right now. Yeah. I, I think the recruiting potential is still there. I mean, it's definitely going to be different for him not being down in the Southern part of the country, but mm-hmm. a, a, as an Oregon fan, I'd say the early returns on his, his recruiting prowess are, are, are pretty darn good because the, the class was down in the 50 to 60 range nationally. It's now up to uh 16th with Kyler Casper's reclassification, helping that out. So, I feel good about that, but I, I'm with you that the the biggest concern I, I had, and I really didn't have that that many personally, but the biggest one is like he hasn't been a head coach. And I was talking about that with his evaluation uh, the other day here on the show. You can go check it out on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the show on podcast right now is you, you don't know what it's like to be a head coach until you're there. You have an idea, of mm-hmm. course, but there are so many responsibilities that come with being a head coach. There are more administrative duties, which might leave you less time to, you know, go in in depth on a game plan or uh, a schematics or talking to your coordinators or whatnot. How do you hire coordinators, right? Those are all things that he hasn't done before. And I think it's very reasonable to expect some growing pains because coordinators make the transition to being a head coach and succeed all the time. Lincoln Riley is a great example of that, but coordinators oftentimes step into being a head coach and it doesn't work out because it's a very different job. You're paid a lot more than you are as a coordinator for a reason, because it, it entails a lot more. And, and he certainly looks and talks the part at this point in time, but he is really young and, and he has to show that he's going to be able to handle all those responsibilities. I think that's unquestionably the the biggest question mark that, that, that you've got there with, with regard to that hire. Another guy who uh, went from coordinator to head coach, but he stayed at the school, was uh, a Jake Dicker, who I found to be a, a really, I still find to be, I should say, a really easy guy to root for. When, when you watch him talk about his team and, and the program that he is now the head coach of, it's it's just hard to root against the guy because he clearly loves the school. He's grateful for the opportunity. I, I love the term he used. When he was the interim head coach, he said he was the interviewing head coach because he very clearly wanted the job. He's got it now. I feel like interim head coaches are, you know, either all the way up here, all the way down there. It was either one year magic that you're not able to replicate, or this is the guy that you're supposed to hire and and things are about to to go really well. I feel like there's almost never an in-between 
with uh, w- with interim head coaches getting the full time job. What did you make uh, of Dickert getting the hire for the Cougs? Yeah, I agree. I, and you know, at, at the time, this hire didn't really move the needle for me. Um, I I thought that you know it was very reminiscent of the Dan Lanning hire, a guy who has no head coaching experience, a guy who has only been a coordinator for a couple of years. Uh, and so my first thought was, wow, this is another risky hire. Um, but I, I think the fact that he did have some experience in the interim role and, and showed that he could lead the program and, you know, turn them around from, you know, all of the distractions that you had during Rolovich's, you know, final few weeks and everything. Um, you know, I, I think he proved a lot in, in his shorts, in his small sample size. And obviously Wazoo won some games with him at the helm. So, uh, he was doing something right. And I, I also think, you know, he really turned that defense around in his short yeah. time there as a coordinator. I mean, Washington State for a long time was a, a team that needed to score 50 points to beat teams. Um, and, and now it's, you know, it's not scoring as much, but it's certainly giving up a lot fewer points. Uh, I think they led the Pac-12 in turnovers last year. Um, at, at least they did, you know, midway through the season when Oregon State was playing. Um, so I think... You know, very similar to Lanning, not a flashy hire, but he has proven to be a successful coach in the roles that he has held. The question is just, you know, can he replicate that as a head coach? And with both of these guys, I think I kind of, you know, in my mind, compare him to Jonathan Smith, who took the Oregon State job after, you know, a very similar situation. He had never been a head coach. He was a really young guy, um, but he had some success in his few years as a coordinator. And look at Jonathan Smith now, you know, five years later, he's turned Oregon State's program around to now the point where we're talking them as talking about Oregon State as a, a contender in the North, uh, you know, after after Oregon State's first bowl game. So th- it's it's obvious, you know, a lot of head coaches take this route and it works out for a lot of them. I think it's finally starting to work out for for Jonathan Smith at Oregon State after he got a few years under his belt. And so, you know, maybe it takes a few years for Jake Dickert and Dan Lanning to to really make their footprint um, to, to take their programs to the level that they want to get to. But, you know, both of them do have success in, in their coaching history. And I think, you know, could very well do what Jonathan Smith has done and, and probably, you know, to a, to a grander scale, obviously at Oregon and, um, at Washington state, I I think you could see them return to, you know, their PAC 12 North prominence that they experienced for a few years there. Yeah, and I said this about Lanning, and I think the same sort of applies to Dickert, is the, the schematical wherewithal and pet, coaching pedigree in that sense is is undeniably there. Statistically, Washington State's defense is so dramatically improved from where it was a couple seasons ago. It's just that they almost feel like a completely different program because you know what they were under Mike Leach was score a million points, and who cares how many they score? We're just going to outscore me, right? It felt like some days they needed to score 50 to win. And now Dickert has kind of shifted the tone and tenor and just kind of the culture to where they've now got, uh, according to Athlon Sports, a preseason first team all Pac-12 edge player in in Ron Stone. And that's just unimaginable for, you know, a, a program five years ago. I, I just don't think that that would have been the case. Both Dickert and Lanning, both, you look at it and you say, okay, they clearly know the X's and O's on their relative side of the ball and i think lanning's probably got some more recruiting chops having been in the sec and whatnot and we've seen that so far but i didn't feel that you know it it raised oregon's profile dramatically and and i don't think dickert does that for washington state it doesn't mean they can't be good head coaches but lincoln riley changes the tone and tenor around the program you know and and even the, the now departed mario cristobal goes to miami changes the tone and tenor and feel around the program because he comes in with a conference championship on his resume and he's going down there to revive the program, right? Like, like that feels different. It feels like you've elevated the the standard and expectations now. And no one's done that more, I think, than Lincoln Riley, because I think USC fans have some pretty lofty expectations, maybe even too lofty in, in year one. But certainly there are, you know, uh, there, there are goals that they have for a pretty quick turnaround there. But Lanning comes in and I say, okay, that's a great defensive coordinator. He recruited very well, got guys to the NFL, and brought in a very recruiting heavy staff. But did I feel that it was, you know, different? Like, d- did Oregon football feel different? Does it feel different now than it did a year ago? I, I would say no, not not really, unless he's able to, you know, go on the field and, and get them beyond where they were a season ago. When, as you pointed out, 
the X's and O's on Saturdays were not where they, they needed to be because Oregon, in some sense, underachieved. And, you know, they did not do what, what they should have in 20, was it 2018? You know, they got off to the hot start. They upset Washington in, in a really big game. But then they went on the road to Washington State and Utah and just dropped duds and Arizona as well, just at laid absolute eggs. And that was, you know, one of the the drawbacks of the Mario Cristobal era at Oregon. And that was that they would have these games where it was just a disaster. And we saw that twice with Utah this year. Those games, th- those games were not just losses, right? Losses happen. Every coach loses at some point. They lost without being competitive. I mean, it was 30 to nothing and 28 to three. I mean, it was just absolutely awful. So I think that's where Landing has the opportunity to you know prove that he's able to elevate a, a program beyond what it was before but you know when the hire came in i was like well that's about the sort of the, the sort of coach that i would expect oregon to to be able to to hire there but uh last thing that that we're getting to today with carter bain senior writer and editor at beaverblitz.com the non-conference schedule this year for the pac-12 has got some pretty juicy contests and i i've gone in on uh i've talked about extensively here on the show in past episodes that was a struggle uh about you know some of the biggest games and and what the biggest opportunities are and there are a lot of them out there but i'm curious as to your thoughts as you look at the non-conference slate which is less than 100 days away and what kind of the the biggest and maybe most realistic opportunities are for the pac-12 to you know kind of raise its profile and help to reestablish itself as a respectable power five conference because right now it's a laughing stock well, the week one slate really stands out to me. And obviously, you know, it gets started with probably the biggest game of the year for the conference in Oregon at Georgia. Um, that game's being played in Atlanta. So I, is it technically a neutral site game? It's listed as that. But sure. Like, yeah, obviously. On. No, I mean, that's that's a home game for Georgia. Yeah, that's going to be um, 80. Eight, eight, that's going to be 80, 20 if Oregon's locked. Yeah. In yeah. The crowd. Which means you're going to have about 65,000 Georgia fans there. Um, yeah, no, I mean, obviously, I, I think, you know, you look down the line and that stands out as the biggest game for the conference. You've got, I, I think, probably, you know, the, the first or second best team in the conference in Oregon going up against the reigning national, you know, reigning national champions. Uh, obviously, there's the storyline of of Dan Lanning coming over from Georgia. Um, it's you know, that's what, what kickoff classic is that? Is it the Chick-fil-A? Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A right. Kickoff. Yep. Right. So, you know, it's, it's going to be on ABC. It's going to be a huge game. You know, game day might be outside Mercedes Benz stadium. Who knows? Probably. Um, that game is, is pretty hard to top, but then later that afternoon you get Utah at Florida, which is another yeah. PAC 12 SEC crossover. Um, reigning Pac-12 champs going down into Gainesville, like that atmosphere, that's another huge one for the conference. You know, if, if you can pull off that win, which I think Utah is probably favored in that game, right? I think they're I mean, favored by about two and a half right now. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, it's it's not an upset by any means, but I think, you know, anytime a Pac-12 team goes into SEC territory, you're like, oh, the, the odds are stacked against them. So, I don't know if that, it's going to be a really good uh, a really good measurement of just how good Utah might be this year, and it comes in week one. The other week one game that I look at is it's not as flashy, but Oregon State against Boise State. I, I think that's big for the Beavers. You know that could very well be the difference between a six and six, seven and five type situation. I mean, who knows? It could be the difference between a bowl game or not. Um, and it's, you know, Boise state is, is a program, I think on the rise right now, they, they had a down year last year, but I think their trajectory looks up. Um, and then, so obviously, you know, the PAC 12 struggled against the mountain West last year. And so that's a, a big opportunity to go up against one of their best teams right away and say, no, we're not going to let you guys walk all over us. Like we did last year. Um, And Boise is also a respectable historical non power five mm -hmm. brand, even when they're not amazing, right? They don't feel like a team like UTSA was in the top 25 at one point last year, but they were 11 and 0, right? And they kind of had to do that. And Boise State never feels that way because they don't play uh, that that easy as schedules, right? They'll go play power five opponents. They've done so regularly. It's why they've, you know, become one of the, one of the biggest non-power five brands in the country but I, I almost think that that game could could be two could be worth two for oregon state in the yeah. sense of 
if you win it. I think it's just a, a tone setter for the rest of the season. They've got Fresno State as well. You'd be hard-pressed to win both of those games, but the Bulldogs have a new coaching staff since Kalen DeBoer's up at Washington now. I mean, if, if Oregon State, they've got an FCS opponent too. I think it's Montana State. Montana State, right, yeah. Who was just in the FCS National Championship game, so don't sleep on uh, – don't sleep on the Bobcats there, but if Oregon State starts 3-0, and I mean, how would they not be in the top 25? Yeah, I mean, as, as far as like non-conference games against non-Power 5 schools go, I don't think you could get a tougher draw than that. A, a Boise State team who is obviously one of the best teams in the Mountain West year in and year out. Fresno State's been right up there, and I, I think Jeff Tedford coming back and you know that, that op- opens up all sorts of opportunities for their offense, especially with Jake Hayner there. Um and then, as you said, Montana State was just in the FCS National Championship, so probably just about the toughest FCS opponent you could schedule. Um, that is a, a brutal non-Power 5 slate for Oregon State, and I think if you go 3-0 and there, uh, you got to feel pretty good if you're a Beaver fan. But um, as far as you know, later later down the, uh, the non-conference slate, three California schools against Notre Dame. I think each one of those is pretty big for the Pac-12, especially a November 26th game between USC and Notre Dame. You and I I were just talking about that. That could be the game of the week in college football on rivalry week if both those teams live up to expectations. That that could be the biggest Pac-12 football game. I mean, obviously it's not an interconference game, but that could be the biggest football game involving a Pac-12 team since Oregon was in the national championship in 2015 and, you know, the Rose bowl, the, a couple weeks before that, obviously. But if you're talking about regular season, gosh, you'd have to, you'd have to go way back. And again, it's not a guarantee, right? If USC goes into it, you know, and they're eight and three trying to get to nine wins in the regular season, that'll give it, it'll still be big, but it'll give it a different feel. Or if Notre Dame goes into it with only seven or eight wins, but if you've got, 18, 19, or 20 combined wins between those two teams going into that game. Boy, that uh that'd be a hot that'd be a hot ticket down down to the Coliseum. Carter Baines is his name. Talking Pac 12 is his game, and he will continue to come back on the show, whether I make corny rhymes about him or not. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Carter. <laughs> Thanks, Spencer. Always a blast. Thanks everybody for listening. See you next time and have a wonderful rest of your day.